So again, who are you? I'm Conrad Feldman. Yeah. And co-founder, you're, co-founder and CEO of Podcast. And we just did an interview, so this is part two, where we're going to get a, a look at what uh, Quantcast actually looks like and what, what you're measuring. So you were tell, just telling me that you were measuring 98,000 web hits or web visits every second? Currently, yeah, we're, we're at 97,740 each second. So, uh, so each, and each one of those, if we go to, to your site, uh, look at the page source, if I go down to the end, we can see this Quantcast tag here. Yeah. And what this means is when someone visits your website, it makes a request from one of our servers. So we operate uh, data centers all around the world to make sure the latency is really, really fast, really low latency. We want to make sure the tags are served quickly so we don't impact your user's experience. And actually, we can see that here, our average average latency in the US is 41.4 milliseconds. So that's extremely fast in terms of the tags. Do you have any, any idea of what percentage of the websites around the world actually have that tag in them? Is it, like, yeah, I mean, it's, well, it's is it pro- probably only 5% or something? It's, it's a low percentage because there's, there's a lot of websites around the world. And of course, many of those websites are quite small. Um, we have, there are, millions of, there are millions of sites that use our tags and we have an increasing Percentage, we're probably getting close to the halfway mark in terms of the sort of the large media companies in the in the U.S., the likes of CBS and NBC and Fox and Disney and MTV networks and so on. So we're getting we're getting very widespread utilization of the platform. And one of the advantages of that is the more data we get, the better the output becomes for everyone. Yeah. So the model is continually getting better, and everyone benefits from that. Very cool. So what does it look like? So now this is a dashboard. Is this, 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 is our, this is our this is our dashboard. I'm just looking at the data here from our dashboard in terms of uh, performance. This is the website. Yeah. And so, you know, on the on the website. Like a radio station, KGO Radio. Okay. Yeah, we have lots of lots of radio. radio is great at lots that. of radio stations and uh, lots, lots of lots of ad networks use our solution to help. Go home, which is right here. Yep. So, do you want to pull up your site? Yeah, let's let's uh, show how bad my stats have been lately. <laughs> Which is actually uh, pretty interesting because um, I I look today and see this big hump here. Okay. I was doing a lot more blogging about a week uh, about a month ago, and that that was around that hump. Right. Well, this is actually this was showing the monthly data. Yeah. We can actually go in and look at the daily, yeah. and you'll see that you know different probably different posts end up driving a lot of traffic. You can see the, uh, you know, you can see the large spikes yes. in traffic that you're getting both in the U.S. and globally. Yeah, I think on uh, that, one, that one day I got on Tech Meme and, you know, right. might have been on Dig for a little while. So, uh, you know, you know that if you get on Dig, you get, you know, 30,000 visits, boom, like yeah. that. And, uh, and, of course, you'll see that when you look at the data over a month. So obviously, when you look at the data, you're probably really interested in the everyday data. Yeah. When a media buyer looks at the data, typically they're interested in longer periods of time. Most media buyers are interested in, a, in sort of the, the rolling monthly yeah. audience size because when they buy, they buy media for a campaign, they're buying over a month or many months. In some cases, people are interested over a shorter period of time, like a week. For example, the movie studios, they want to blast the hell out of their new film before the weekend. They're interested in how much audience a particular site gets over the space of maybe a week. Yeah. Can we go and compare to like uh, kgoradio.com? Yeah, do you know what the website is? I think it's just kgo.com or kgo. Eh, try kgo.com and see what happens. No, that's, that's not it. Um, do a Google on kgo radio then. It might be kgoradio.com or something like that. Really. kgoradio.com. Okay, cool. Let's do that. So that's the local radio station. It's the number one radio station in Northern California. Here we go. So let's go to... So when you look at this chart, what, what are you learning? And it's hard to see on the camera. So what are you seeing here? There's a bunch so of basically we have yeah, So basically, for each of the sites here, we have, we have uh, two lines being shown. One shows the U.S. traffic. This is every day. And the other one shows the global traffic, which includes the U.S. So right now, we break it out into global and U.S. Uh, shortly, we'll actually break it out over time by individual countries. We also have a piece of data here that shows the distribution of that data. I'll run into that in just a moment. Now, it's interesting because a radio station's advertisers probably care more about the region, right? Like uh, Sleep Train is one of KGO's top advertisers. Let's take a They're look. only uh, here in the San Francisco Bay Area, so they don't care that somebody in Germany is listening to their 
advertisement. That's right. So, and, and for especially for you know, local is a great example because local local is one of the areas that have really suffered from um, panel-based solutions yeah. because they're very their panels aren't very good at picking up biases, and a local audience is a particular type of bias. It's one of the reasons people go to the site is because they are local and they're getting local information. So you'll notice here there's a there's a geographic tab. Yeah. We can actually break it down and look at where the audience comes from, and I can look at the top cities here. Wow, Oakland, Oakland, San Francisco, San Jose, Sacramento. And what we're seeing here is the size of the audience, but also how it indexes relative to the average internet site. So what this means is, is, that, um, is that the KGO radio is 37 times as effective at reaching people in the city of San Francisco as the average internet site. And if I look out at the DMAs, so television advertising is bought according to DMAs. So what does DMA stand for? DMA is a designated marketing area. Okay. So, so the DMA for our area here in San Francisco incorporates all of San Francisco, Oakland, and San Jose. Yeah. And the, radio, the television stations cover that whole area. So we can actually see here, if I bring up the, I'll bring up the drill down on the DMAs, the top DMA for KGO Radio is the San Francisco, Oakland, San Jose DMA. And actually, 60% of the audience comes from that. It's all local. So for Sleep Train, they're reaching that local audience. That penetration is so high uh, compared to a, a national the national website or news program wouldn't have anything like that penetration in the local DMA. Very cool. Um, and we can also break that down by businesses, the types yeah. of businesses. Which for B2B advertising, it's very important to understand the types of businesses. Yeah. Um, put in Fast Company, because there, there's an interesting lesson there, too. This, so this is really interesting, because you can see the different kinds of audiences, and you can look at them different ways. Uh, KGO right. Radio... Or a radio station is going to, or a restaurant is going to care much more about its local area. Yeah. They don't care about somebody in Germany. Yeah, absolutely. In our, in our media planner, we allow people to actually search for a, an audience that has a certain set of characteristics in a particular DMA yeah. or set of DMAs. Yeah. So, so, so this company, you can see uh, our traffic's been going up lately after a little. Absolutely. Little actually, run. you can see here for Fast Company, one of the interesting things you can see here is Fast Company is part of the, is it Mansuto? Is that yeah. the way to pronounce it? Yeah. Mansuto Publishing Network which has a number of sites. So not only can we measure an individual site, but when a media company owns multiple properties, we can aggregate them together so that you can understand the unduplicated characteristics of that whole audience. Yeah, because uh, Mansueto owns Inc. Magazine and Fast Company Magazine and FastCompany.tv and a few other go. things. We can take a look here. If we click underneath the network view here on the sites, we can see each of the individual sites. And you know, some of these uh, media companies have thousands of yeah. properties. So we can, we can see the individual sites here and their relative size and their most recent uh, trend over four months. Then we can pick Fast Company here, and if we go to traffic, we can take a look at the daily. But one, one thing you can see here is we've been putting more blogs, and uh, we redesigned our web page right. Uh, right around this time. So you can see our redesign yeah, yeah. and our new... But you can uh, certainly see the, the increasing trend here. When you look over the monthly basis, which takes into account the total number of people yeah. over, over the trailing 30 days, you can see that increase. Yeah, so you can see uh, management changed uh, editorial policy and uh, design, and it really is uh, picking up. So right. hopefully that trend continues. Absolutely. <laughs> Looks like a great success. Um, what else can you learn from uh, looking around the chart? Give me uh, two or three things that most people might not know about. Well, or one, of the, one of the interesting things you can take a look at is the, the frequency with which the audience returns. Yeah. So we, we break that down into um, passes by regulars and addicts. So many sites have a lot of passers by because they'll find a particular article that's emailed to them, they'll go and visit that uh, site, read that article, but they don't necessarily come back uh, on a regular basis. At the other extreme, you have sites that have a lot of addicts. Yeah. So social media sites have lots of addicts. You know, the visitors are back you know, every day or multiple times per day. Yeah. And everything else in between are regulars. An addict is someone who visits the site once or more a day. Yeah. And uh, that's I, I visit. Friend feed, I think about 500 times. <laughs> right, there you go. You're, you're, you're on the end. That's, that's, you know, it's useful to understand as a site owner. It's very important for marketers to understand because different sorts of marketers are looking for different types of frequency of exposure in their campaigns. You know, some are looking just for reach, so yeah. sites with a large number of passes by work very well for them. Some want to get their message repeatedly in front of the same individuals, so they're looking for a certain amount of frequency. That's an important piece of data. Marketers often talk about reach and frequency. Yeah, that's the some of the criteria they're looking for, alongside the characteristics of the audience. Yeah, can you use this to figure out who is influential in your market space? 
Because, like, like, if you just started a tech blog today and you didn't know who Mike Arrington was, you didn't know who I was, you didn't know who Giga Om, you know, Om Malik is, and you didn't know who tech me- what tech meme is or dig, could you use this system yeah. to figure out you could, so what, who the movers and shakers are in, in the tech space? I don't know whether it would tell you who the influencers are, but you could certainly get a set of sites that would be interesting ones for you to track. You could use our media planner to say, find me all the sites that are focused on technology that attract a lot of readers in California of a certain size. And you could use that to narrow down, narrow down your site. I'm not sure it would get you to the, uh, to the influencers. Well, I think that would. It would, yeah, it would, certainly, it would certainly get you a subset of things that would be useful to, to start with. Yeah. And you can get access to that in the media planner. So the, uh... And it, by the way, does this cost anything? No. And, it's, it's and free. everything you've been showing me is free? It's free to use, and it's also free for any publisher to use. Okay. So we will be introducing services throughout the course of this year that help the publishers that we work with better organize their audiences. Okay. So when marketers are looking for a particular audience, and we can link them up with the section of their audience that's most appropriate for them, uh, marketers will be willing to buy those audiences, and we'll charge for those, for those services. Okay. The Quantified Publisher Program, use of the website, use of the media planner, that's all free. Now, what, how do you guys make money then? So as, as our data starts to be used um, in a more real-time environment to help a publisher actually deliver very specific segments of an audience that might match a marketer's requirements. So for example, if a, if a credit card company wants to run a campaign to reach people in small businesses, we'll help the publishers that we work with deliver a campaign just to the people in small businesses. Okay. That enables them to command higher CPMs because for the advertiser, there's much less wastage. And as part of that process, we get paid by the publisher for enabling that. Very cool. Anything, last thing that you'd like to show us? Yeah, that? the media planner is kind of neat. So the media okay. planner, the media planner allows uh, you to go in and say, "Hey, I'm looking for a certain set of sites. I want to find sites that are uh, popular with women, uh, 18 to 49." Yep. And you're just clicking off. Boxes just clicking off those here. things. And it's really hard to see uh, on this camera. So. Um, and and just and if any, you just go to quantcast.com and look for media planner. It's easy yep. to get access to this. And of course, the largest sites have the most of those sorts of people. But if we actually sort this by composition, we'll find the sites that have the largest number of people in that particular group. Okay. And I can add in other filters if I want to look for the more affluent audiences. I can add in an additional filter. Now, how do you how do you know what the the audience's affluence range is? So, we we collect um, a lot of data directly from websites through our yeah. tags. We also have a whole range of reference data sets, samples like traditional media measurement. We have relationships with market research companies, toolbar vendors, ISPs, and in many cases, we have information about. Uh, the individual. We don't have any personally identifiable information, but we have responses to surveys, such as age, gender, the number of household, uh, children in the household, the household's income level. And what we have is a mathematical process that combines all that data and enables us to produce the estimates that you see on the website. Wow. Is there any way, because um, I, I know on some, on some sites, on some measurement sites uh, that compete with you, that if I write in a certain style for a certain kind of audience, that I go up higher than the average than if I wrote for another audience because the, oh, I see. the so, panel is biased towards a certain kind yeah, I think of you audience. Often, you often see that where, where the, so first of all, all panels are, well, it's, it's less to do with panels being biased and the fact that media choices are incredibly biased. But all panels, no panel can capture all the different biases that may exist in terms of an audience. And the example you're giving is one that's often found with uh, toolbar-based solutions yeah. because the toolbar is, is marketed to a particular audience. It may be an audience that's really interested in search engine optimization. They have this toolbar to understand that, so search engine optimization type sites always score higher. But even with, even with panels that are sort of recruited in more traditional means by calling people up, you tend to miss sections of the population. So for example, businesses and business audiences are often underrepresented by panels because large businesses won't allow software to be installed that's reporting back where everyone's visiting. It's one of the advantages of our solution is that even when someone visits a website when they're in a Fortune 100 company, there's still a record of that created. So, and in fact, we can help the, uh, the publisher understand what proportion of the traffic comes from those different companies. Wow. Oh, that's interesting. So you, can you look that up? Can I, can I see uh, how many people come from Microsoft? Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, 
course, with Microsoft, it's easy because I can also look at how many people are looking from Redmond, Washington. Well, and right. there's not too many other businesses in Redmond, Washington, uh, other than Nintendo up there. But well, let's take let's take a look. Let's bring yeah. up your site. In fact, when I went to Google, <laughs> when I worked at Microsoft, and I went to Google, they had a a display that showed all the searches being done right. live around the world, and they were spraying off the world. And Redmond was a column of white light coming up there. And I went back and talked to Bill Gates and said, hey, there's too many Google searches being done here. I think there's, there's probably a lot getting done from, from everywhere. So here's, yep. here's, here's your site. Yep. And what we can see here is, is that 32% of your uh, visitors in the US are actually accessing your site from their business. Okay. And we can do that because we see a lot of traffic. We understand the, the, the usage patterns of those different businesses. But then we actually can see that of all the different businesses we see, and of course there's a lot we see, we don't just list them all. We list the ones that are most interesting. Yeah. And what we can see here is that there were you know, 657 large businesses that we thought were interesting. If I filter, let's bring up the ones in the US. This is not available publicly. This is available for the individual owners. So okay. you can look at your own your own site here. And if we, if we want to look for Microsoft, do a quick filter, and there we go. And, you know, Microsoft uses your site a lot. Yeah. So 896 uh, uniques from Microsoft in uh, over the last month. Can I see a chart of that over time? We don't have that currently. So because it's one, it's one of the things here's why I'm asking, because I've worked at Microsoft, and uh, they have mailing lists to all employees in, internally, and, and some of those mailing lists have you know 10,000 people on them. Right. And so when I, when I emailed around a blog and said, oh, look what Mike Arrington oh, just okay. wrote about Microsoft today. We get a lot of coverage. It would get yeah. instant hits. Yeah. I mean, Mike used to call me and go, what the hell did you just do? Right. <laughs> or right. what, what's going on? Because right. I just got 2,000 hits from Redmond, you know, yeah. <laughs> and you could see it yeah, on the yeah. servers. <laughs> yeah, it's an, it'd be an interesting... It'd be an interesting idea to provide that data as a time series. Yeah. It's sort of one of the things that we always have to balance here in terms of all the things that we could do with the data are, are getting the right set of things that are most, are most useful. And yeah. one of the things that we tend to focus on are what are the pieces of data that will help a marketer make a decision about spending money with a, with a website. Yeah. And, and for, for, them, for them, what it does, but only in the aggregate not yeah. on the individual day because they can't plan for that. Yeah. So they have to think about things where they can plan ahead and spend their money in advance. And so typically they're looking over those longer time horizons. Yeah. Um, it, it's, yeah, it's interesting though to be able to watch that. I, I find it's interesting that you watch both home and business. Are right. you seeing a change in that because of the economy? I mean, as more people get laid off, you should be able to see I, a shift. I, I, have, I haven't looked at that recently, but certainly would expect to see that be reflected. And you also see differences based on the types of uh, events. So we did some uh, really interesting work with NBC around the Olympics yeah. uh, last year. And of course, because of the, the, the time of day, a lot of the viewership was done at, at work because yeah. everything was happening in, in, in China. Yeah. And so you know, capturing those sorts of things with sort of more traditional panel-based research services has proved very difficult. And of course, with the direct measurement approach, it's very straightforward to understand all of those at-work audiences. Very cool. Well, cool. This has been a, a lot of fun, and uh, I think I got a lot of useful Good. stuff here. Um, if, if there's anything else that you would tell a small business or a b business owner who's putting measurement in, you know, if there's any secrets or I mean, tips. Or I would certainly um, get signed up with the Quantified Publishing Program. It's free, and as the site owner, you can control how much data you want to share publicly. Yep. Uh, there's a, a lot of tips and resources on our site. There's white papers on methodology and how we deal with things like cookie deletion. And if people have any questions, contact us. Contact details are there on the website. We'll be happy to help people get set up or answer any questions they have. Very cool. Thank you so much. Thank you.